writing this as we go along. I think that ev like every person, every generation has got to be just trying things and trying different strategies and methods that may be the complete opposite of Foreman or any of the people who've come before. You know? right. I just think we have to have that kind of courage. That also is a kind of generosity. It's interesting that whole thing about, I mean, Ruth Malachick told us last year that like, you know, avant-garde, like she talked a lot about like being before the front in like a military sense. Which is which really stuck with me, but I, I are we talking about theatrical walkouts? The uh, yeah. No, no, no. But yeah. just in terms of like experimentation of what you're saying or non non tradition, it's it's all very confusing when you start talking about like what is avant garde and what is not avant garde. I guess we're talking about what's not. It should be a style. In it's Midtown, like, maybe it's what's often not a style. in Midtown. You know? <laughs> Frustrated though when it's by zip code. I just wanted to. I wanted to surprise me where it is. I want to find it all over the place. And I think it is. I mean, like if anybody watched any of the footage of that of the girl from SWAT who was shot in the, uh, yeah. the documentary, and there's a, there's a, a moment in the documentary where the school girls in her school are are reading a statement about their their valley and 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 how they're not going to leave. And it's just it's. I mean, that, maybe that sounds totally stupid in some ways, or pretentious, or like I'm imposing that, but so this line of girls and this like incredible courage, and they're framing it theatrically. There's the line, and then there's a girl in the front, and she's saying it, almost singing it. And I'm like, that's, that, that obliterates zip code. You know? Right. Do you, how do you guys feel about, I, I'm just interested because each of you have such diverse experience with Foreman help you with David Lynch or with Ann Bogart or with you know with working with these other people that kind of knowledge yeah and, and vice versa I mean for, for David Lynch I, I think uh, I was doing Twin Peaks <coughs> I forget <coughs> was when he called me up to do Void Set you know my agent was horrified you know that I'd just gotten a <laughs> major television series you know on Twin Peaks and I was going to go do Void Set you know, and uh, and it was just amazing. That's that is my Hamlet. You know, all actors want to have their Hamlet. You know, and, and it was just an amazing experience. You know, because it was this other world. You know, the way Lynch creates his. You know, and and, uh, and Kate was a big fan. Of Kate Man, I'm a Twin Peaks at the time, and uh, you know, so uh, and I remember directly coming from. Uh, I don't think it was the Mind King yet. I think that was after that. But it, but uh, a, a film is evil, radio is good, and, and using some of the, the things, the acting moments that are on the series, uh, Twin Peaks, you know. So uh, yeah, it, it did feed back and forth. And is it, and Juliana, has it pictures a writer too? That's an interesting question. Um, I I don't know. Maybe maybe not. But. Uh, Perhaps in terms of, of of just being connected, like in a way, like I mean, I'm the, of the generation. Like I think I'm older than a lot of you guys here, but I wasn't here in the '70s. But I, I I'm very aware of the absence of the artists who died of AIDS. I'm sort of like the generation who got the tail end of that terrible experience, and so I'm aware of the gap between the artists in the 60s and the 70s and then the decimation and then what's going to happen now? What is my generation going to do? We just lost uh, basically a whole bunch of elders, I think. And so Foreman, I guess, is an influence in me because, for me because he kind of, as a writer, is a link back to a time when people were making like just wild experiments and, 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 and having an enormous idea of what an artist's place in the world was. And, and I think a lot of artists in my generation have felt kind of constricted and have felt, oh, there's no money and housing is really expensive and so our work is going to be small and ironic. And, and it's, it's just such a wonderful thing to have a connection to the generation that was just like, whoa, we, we're going to, we are important, we are, we are 
people who affect change in the world. And we're not just you know, in a grubby place pushing our cars. I feel like that's still true, right? About, about what's being made right now? Do you, about that it's not the same, that there's a little bit, the trepidation, the the obsession with, with like the budget and the money and that stuff, even among like friends of mine who are creating their own smaller work. Um, I think that's still true. I mean, I'm a mom now, so I have like, I've had about two years where I, I haven't seen enough stuff because mm. I've been with the kid a lot. But um, yeah, I think, I think we are too fearful and so it, in general. Is like whether you create work that's inspired by someone like Foreman or whether you go off in a completely different direction, I think to be inspired by. Like, I mean, I remember one time I was working at here and I had to like make a little panel talk, and so I <laughs> and I made the um, the mistake of inviting um, Lee Brewer, Lee Brewer and uh -huh. Richard Foreman, and I put them next to each other on stage, Oops. and they were like. <laughs> I actually like, oh, yeah, and Ruth, and so I was like, oh, I have you know, I have David and, and Richard and Ruth Malachek and, and Lee, and they'll talk about like what their you know processes were like, and it was absolutely terrifying because it just became about like Richard and Lee like smoldering at each other, and I like was sitting in a chair and I actually hurt my back. It was so nerve wracking just sitting there. I was like, ah, why did I do this? <laughs> but then it was fascinating because after like just like sparks flying and like Richard's saying. Been so uncomfortable in my whole life. <laughs> um, all these personalities. All these personalities. <laughs> like, at the very end, they somehow suddenly turned their concern to the younger artists who were sitting in the house. And they told us, and the, the people who were younger than me, me and the younger ones, even younger, like, we, we don't know how you do it. Like, we really, you know, we have no idea how you do anything. We had resources you don't. We honestly are. I don't know if they said amazed, but they were, they gave like people props, younger people trying to do stuff. Yeah. It was very moving and, and stuck with me. Yeah, it was so much easier to do work because there, spa there were spaces were available and also you could live on your unemployment check. I mean, I remember rehearsing those plays, you know, just like getting, going to report unemployment and you mm -hmm. could kind of get by. And now I just don't know how anyone does it. I do. Yeah, yeah, we're going to just open that, it up. That, that just about the, the generation you're talking about, they were also very interested in burning down the status quo, if they had anything in common. Yeah. And I don't think we don't, people don't even know what the status quo is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my perception of, of the common generation, because you just want to get into it whatever it is, well, I, the theater. They just want a place somewhere. Whereas- They just want to be like famous or franchised. Just be in it, just be in it right. somehow. Right. And, and I think that generation, those people that we're talking about, the Alchex and, and the, the generation of the 60s playwrights, for instance, who were- They actually had a couple of fucking- They, were, they had a, a position, and the position was that the, that the traditional theater that was being done off-Broadway and on-Broadway was, should should be destroyed. That that a new order should come forth. So of course they're they're they have different approaches to it. They have different approaches to what they think should be instead of what is. And I don't I don't feel that kind of critique of well but that's as another <coughs> person who lived through it. Yeah. I, I think that was absolutely a reflection of the larger currents of the culture. Yeah. As is what we're experiencing now. Uh, I always feel uh, how lucky, in a certain way, uh, those of us of that era were to have something as clear and present and defined as the enemy or the demon or the <laughs> thing, like the Vietnam War and the draft. It was very clear, and there were very clear stakes. Uh, you know, I got a draft number. I could have been there. Um, and it's much less... And, and what Linda, absolutely what Linda's saying, there was a clear sense of this is the old order, it's got to go away. We had a confidence that we could change the world. We believed that the world could be better, that human nature could improve. And I think we are now older, everybody's wiser to that. 
And um, that, that certainty and that um, sense of a, a, a moral uh, imperative has evaporated for us all. It's much more complicated and much more uh, amorphous. As to why we're creating. Yeah, well, yeah or what, what is the artist's role? It was so much clearer then. Richard, 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 yes. Richard was a Yale Yes. Richard was a Yale playwright. Yeah. So, yeah. You guys should jump in on this. Like, start raising your hand. Yeah. Um, I just had a question. I was fortunate enough to work uh, on my first porn show with Juliana and Francis Kelly uh, on King Cowboy Rufus. And I just wanted to know in regards to his earlier work, because when we, uh, when I worked with him, he was just there. I mean, you had the long, extensive rehearsal period followed by an extended performance period, and he was in the house all the time, pretty much right in front of you, controlling his board, which I never knew exactly what he was controlling, his volume or sound effects, but just always there, and it just clicked on me when you mentioned, you know, imagine you're performing for the one intelligent person in the audience, that he was always in the audience. <laughs> uh, but I was just wondering, in regards to his earlier work, if, if it was the same kind of uh, experience, if he was there every night, just controlling things, moving switches, and staring you down. Oh, yeah. 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 He was there every night. I was present. Oh, I remember this, I don't know, I, I, you know, it's so far back now, but I remember that we were doing The Mind King, and there was one night where he was always at the show, and we finished it, and he came back into the dressing room, and he was like, you all were terrible, you were doing that kind of acting, it makes me want to vomit. And he just was going off on it, and David Herskovitz was our, was his assistant then, and he, Was John Collins on that too? I think John was, was one of the sound, and David was his assistant. And um, Richard left, and, and we were kind of sitting in the dressing room, like, wow, this is really terrible. And David came back, and he said, uh, Richard's father died today, his, uh, his, step, his adopted yeah. father. And it was such a, you know, it, he was reacting to an over-emotional way we were playing the play, and I think it was so much more his, what he was experiencing as he watched it that night. You know, it was like where he went, and uh, so it was. It, it was very. Uh, you, you never knew what he was going to say. I mean, he was there every single show. I just wonder if any of you want can talk about <clears throat> having had my own experience of things from a different angle. What was it like to live in the world of in his world of design and um, the strings <coughs> and the sounds? And, We, we love the, the props, you know, we always, everybody, you know, discuss what their favorite prop was. I mean, you know, it, it, but it's a, another one of those things that sort of disappears after, I can't, I can't remember, <coughs> you know, monsters, horrible monsters from your psyche coming there, or, you know, uh, it, it just was great. You know, there were these flat chairs that Henry and I had to sit in, or try to sit in, that was the whole oh, yeah, the object. Painting. Paintings of chairs. Paintings of chairs, <laughs> flat chairs, yeah, paintings of chairs. And, uh, you know, the, it, it, it's just a, a, a wonderfully imaginative uh, playhouse, you know, that you get to be in. And the first day you go to rehearsal, it was all done. I mean, the whole set was installed. And it got, there was, became this thing where you had to learn all of your lines before you showed up. So it would start, and the tapes were all made. So everything would just, you just kind of walked into this. I'm not an actress <coughs> right there, but it was kind of like, wow, <laughs> it's all here. And then as it went on, you'd come into rehearsal someday and Richard would be like tearing down the old skulls and putting up some new skulls and put, you know, taping everything over again. So the set was always kind of evolving. Yeah, this is his yeah, painterly thing. Yeah. yeah, this painterly thing that he loves, always tweaking the little strings and, you know, doing different things, taking it down, putting it up. I think. I'm, I hope I'm revealing this correctly, but I think I remember, you know, he's very competitive in, a, in the best way possible with all other directors. And uh, Martha Clark had done some play with a beautiful script in front of it. Do you know what that was? Vienna. Vienna Los Tos. Vienna Los Tos, you know. And, and that's when he started using the plastic screens in front, because I mentioned it. You know, I mentioned it to him. I said, what a great play this was, very interesting. He said, oh, that sounds terrible. But then, <laughs> wonderful plastic screen that became a a, a, a great uh, thing because you you know 
know, sometimes sitting in the audience and you can see your reflection, so you're sort of in the play as well. And, you know, he just, you know, it's just like other painters, like Picasso and Brock, you know, like picking up something from somebody else and putting it on, doing your own thing with it, you know. So I love that aspect of it too, you know. And, uh, yeah, can't think of a, a favorite prop at the moment. Sort of like a scriptomania to it. Like it sort of seems oh, the like scripts, they were great. Because Kate was, you know, uh, you didn't get to work with her. Henry and I did, and she had an apron that she wore where she had scissors and white out and things because you'd memorize your lines and have them all done. But then they would change constantly and be rearranged. So you had these layered scripts where you'd cut out something, paste something else in, and <laughs> that became a whole object of its own, you know. and. Uh, you know, this way of working that you had to, you know, a little tool kit, like your art class tool kit all the time to write something in, put something on, put a piece of tape over something, and, you know. It was interesting to get used to the fact that it wasn't going to be beautiful. Like, in fact, if you said something was beautiful, it oh, would yeah. change. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so you were like, oh, you know, I remember I said a light was beautiful. He's like, change it. And I'm like, oh, beauty is the first touch of terror you could still bear, and it still didn't work. That's <laughs> <laughs> because Richard, uh, 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 Robert Wilson came to him one time and said, Richard, why does everything have to be so ugly all the time? You know, so he said, that sounds that good. That was a compliment. <laughs> so, that was for him, you know. And there was a poor set designer who had done this for um, Pearls for Pigs, had done a glorious backdrop that was just gorgeous. It was really pretty. And uh, I told her, and Richard was standing nearby, I said, oh, that looks glorious. And she just became so tense. Yeah. I said, don't, don't say that, don't. don't say that. And sure enough, it became brown. Oh, no. <laughs> do, do you guys, do, do you have, it, my, my partner Lola worked in a number of Richard's shows, and I remember one of the things, Lola's a comedian. Oh, and likes I was the in, I was lucky enough to be in. We worked together. Film She's evil. the kind of actor who likes to farm the, how does that joke work? And then she wants to laugh. And she would say, what does that work? And she well, gets it. But Richard, you, you find a way that that works, he, yeah. no, he's gone. He takes it away. <laughs> Do you have, well, you, you spoke a bit about that. Did he ever, did he have Norman Foreman when you guys were working with him? <laughs> <laughs> who was that? <laughs> he would say, I mean, this is kind of how he would deal with us being despondent about things being undermined like that. But he would say that his brother would sneak in and direct the play and it would be funny and appealing and accessible and that was Norman for me. <laughs> and Richard would come back and he would be shocked and depressed and he'd just destroy Norman's work. <laughs> Um, you, know, you all speak with such a trust about him, but it seems like you also had these sort of traumatic early experiences where, you know, you were locked as a gnome in a hallway, <laughs> or like a fraction of a hallway, and you were like, I have this great toolkit, and now I can't use any of it. At what point uh, did it go from, I respect this person because I respect their reputation, to having your own sort of personal experience of, wow, I, I have to work with this guy, even if it means, you know, saying, I'm going to do void sex in the middle of between the weeks or it's, it's just that philosophical thing again. You know, if you think, if you want to work on Shakespeare, if you want to work on Ibsen, you want to work on, you know, choose your favorite thing. You know, they have these concerns that are just transcendent. And it, to me, he's our American Beckett. You know, so it goes, goes to that, and you want to work on that. And you can feel it even if I can't articulate it. I know it's there. You know, it's just like I know with these other artists as well, you know. And uh, so, so I think that's it. But the... You're speaking about these these traumas, you know. He he's the playwright, and he's going to dark places for himself, and he will make you go to dark places if you will. If you don't want to, you don't have to, you know. But if you want to, for your own personal reasons, he'll make you go there. And uh, some of them I can't even speak about. You know, there's some psychological places he took me through, but it was like great analysis where you can bust through. Thank God, you bust through. You don't end up, you know, in the loony bin somewhere. Is that PC? You know, it works. And you have personal breakthroughs. Or to, you know, breakthroughs. That was true for Voidsec. It was true for Girls for Pigs uh, and the Mind King as well. And, and do you have any advice on, uh, uh, on uh, I guess, how to find people like that? Because that, I mean, that all sounds very exciting. I just think <laughs> you, see, you should see, you should just see lots of things. I mean, I, I was drawn to him because I'd seen his plays and I just felt I have to work with this person. And um, it really was a kind of a path. <coughs> I, I, I followed his great, I saw it. You know, I, I could point to it and say, that's what I want to do. Any 
anybody know you want to work with? Young Jean, for me, I'd like to do something for Young Jean. Yeah, me too. <laughs> anybody on your list at the moment? Uh, Mr. Fish. Is any good? I've had the pleasure. James Nicola, I've had the pleasure of being directed by. You know, it's weird that, I, like, we seem to be talking a lot about how dark he was and how rich for a bit and how brooding it is and how he takes from these, you know, really intense psychological places. And I, I've always found the work that I love is just like, it's a fucking great time. Yeah, it's so I funny. Mean, So the interesting thing of the form and the content of the, you know, the form of it is so antic, and the content of it I always found very serious, and and what what we were going through was always very kind of traumatized. So I think it, there's something in the in the dichotomy of like that antic behavior and the undercurrent that made it interesting and funny. I think it's a gift, you know. It's a comic sensibility that he has. But he's a great, as much and as I think, Sorry, and I think like the, the, the places for me where it always, where it really changed was like, you know, I don't think Henry Andrews saw you do with anything. I don't think we really did, but I've seen, EP, I've seen you do this. And I think like there's something, like, there was there were certain actors who were able to bring, I don't know, a kind of depth to the material or a kind of humanity to the material, whether he instructed, whether he wanted that or not, you were doing it. And so somehow it, Yeah, I didn't it, care it, it, if he it, wanted to it, do that. It drops. That's that's what but, I, that, but somehow the piece, you know, elevates to a to a different level, which when I did his first play the first of his plays, because um, Dr. Saleby, he didn't quite write all the words. That was a sort of partial commission that he did, and it was his first successful hit. But the cure was the first one. <laughs> And uh, uh, and uh, I was studying, I, I was 35, and I reread all of Stanislavski, and I wanted to get better. And I went to Mira Rostova. I don't know if you know who she is, but she was a great, uh, one of the last uh, gurus of acting like Lee Strasberg and those kind of people. She taught Montgomery Clift and Jessica Lange and, and allegedly threw Madonna out of her class and stuff like that. But, it, it, you know, she was great. She was with the Moscow Art Theater, and, and, uh, and I, I took uh, the cure the, to her class. And, and she was legendary for, you know, you start reading to be or not to stop, you know, and then she'd rip your face off. <laughs> and uh, so I took the cure into that class, you know, and, and there was a great uh, uh, dancer who came to see the play, uh, and he, he said, uh, I saw emotion leap, is what he said. It was one of my favorite. And I had to just sit there. And, and so I just to entertain myself, I sort of sat near Richard and I tried to figure out, like, oh, I think he's going to change that move or try to guess what he was going to do or which turns he was going to make. And um, I, I sort of started to kind of perceive patterns that I don't think I would have if I hadn't been waiting around for three weeks to make my entrance with the <laughs> painted nipples and things. <laughs> yeah, but, um, but it was really, I mean, I think some of the humor and the levity and the, the sort of ballon is in that uh, like amazing choreography because it's really tight and precise and, and worked over. You know, it was, it but was when something. you're done, it's so satisfying. It's like being in a, an amazing machine. You know, it's, it's just really satisfying to do it every night. And he, I remember he said to us, when you finish the play, your friends should say, you are levitating. <laughs> <laughs> they should have a quality <clears throat> always would try to get that and you'd have moments of you know like oh, I almost got it I almost got off the ground <laughs> and so challenging you know and we did the cure and my first task was to come out first and look at every single person in the audience and connect with them so it's so engaging and, I'm, and he has all kinds of different ways that he does that too did, did any of you have any experiences <clears throat> in working on um, Plays that he didn't write. Yeah, Boyd's sick. 
was great up at, at Hartford, uh, you know, the Buchner play, right. and they, it was it was just uh, great. And I, I said, I kept asking, why don't you do Shakespeare? He said, it's too much language. It's just mm -hmm. so hard to get people unified in your style and stuff like that. But he loved the fragmented language of Buchner's play. You know, it's just these little jewel, if you don't know it, it you know, it's an amazing thing that this young playwright, uh, Georg Buchner, wrote in, in reaction to the Sturm and Drang of uh, Schiller and uh, Goethe and, you know, these high-blown things. And this was about a common soldier. And he just, you know, and it's just this wonderful thing that was left, I think it was 11 scenes or something. He, he died before he finished it. And so they just left these scenes that directors organize the way they do. It's very filmic and it's just a transcendent drama, you know, uh, really fantastic. So, uh, and he was great for that, Jim, because uh, the critics said there's no strings, you know. There was only a few strings way up, you know, <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, it was just a, and he wanted to prove, I think, he never stated this, but that he could be true to a playwright's vision. And he was, it was a big success. It was just amazing. But we got people, it was very, very, very intense. And we got, you know, 10% of the audience walking out pressure of this guy murdering his common law wife, you know, um, and, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was really great. There was that period where he did so many plays, and yeah. they were such revelations. Yeah. I mean, he met three acts of recognition with the public, and uh, I, they're just things I'll never, I mean, they, he was a great well, the, world the class. Three penny. Three, the three penny opera will never. The best thing I've ever oh, seen. Yeah. I wish he were here to talk with me. He did this play on Broadway that ran for one night. He was hired to be a director for this play called Stages. It was written Stuart by- Stuart Ostro. Stuart Ostro <laughs> wrote it. It was, and he produced it. And Richard would talk about this thing, and I, I can't, I just can't even do it justice. It just, it was, it was so incredible. But there was this time where Richard was, he did Three Penny Opera, and then he was hired to do a big Broadway show. And uh, like that kind of thing just doesn't, Yes. Yes. Um, I got to work with Richard in school, um, taking notes from him like a couple years ago. Um, and one thing, I think he gets a really bad rap for being really bad to actors. But what I saw in the room was like a lot of respect and um, Absolutely warmth true. and like guidance. And I was wondering if that was the same experience for you guys, like support. Like he was really supportive of the actors as I saw it. Oh yeah, it was always, if you don't want to do that, you know, he's always, yeah, he wouldn't realize, you know, sometimes he'd just say, can you hold that pan up to this other person's face and, and just pull their hand like this, and then it would snap back and hit him. You know, and he wouldn't realize, he's just doing it, you know, but, so he'd have to figure things out, you know, and uh, but it was always a question of, you know, can you do this, will you do this, you know, and, and generous in, in that way. Sort of a peripheral detail, really, but I just remember after every show, he would give us a, a hardcover book that he'd like picked out for everybody. Did he do that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that he would make like you know he, like so many people had worked, you know, he didn't work for very much money. People were getting paid, and then so many others were working for nothing for three months of rehearsal and then the three months of the run. But like opening night, he would take everybody out to like a you know, three course dinner, and there's something very moving to me about that, this kind of like old world quality that, that it's just really precious. Yeah, and the great gift of working more and more with them was that things would become tailored for you. And you know, you'd say, why can't, can I say more complex things? And so you'd get, in the next play, you'd get more complex things to say. Can I be more physical, you know? And so you would really be physical in the next play, you know? So that, that's a, a great gift. And, why I admire uh, the younger actors uh, like uh, Elevator Repair Service and, and, and the Wooster Group uh, and uh, these big, big dance theater uh, of Paul Bazaar who was supposed to be here, it's because you get a shorthand and you get to work with people and grow in that way. And I've always really enjoyed that. My earliest influences were the Open Theater and, and uh, uh, Gutowski's company, you know, that, that had this wonderful, I don't know, it was like a glue and 
physical glue between everybody, you know, and really get to be an amazing ensemble. We have time for one more question, and you raise your hand first. <laughs> <laughs> um, just listening to you talk about this man, Greg, uh, writing the script with emotional therapy and physical therapy, it, it sounds delicious, and it sounds like it, it, it wouldn't go over well in Midtown, but, um, like, you know, the, his ability to have all that control on so many different levels, um, people resisting that, but if there was a hierarchy or one that always you landed on, was it his script, was it his emotional choreography that you could, that as things shifted, did one filter down and, 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 and have a strength that the others didn't have that you could rely on, that the script was where you would end up, or that his emotional understanding of what was happening in the play was where you would end up? Was there one that was that was stronger than the other as far as all the different ways that he would choreograph and use you? I would say no. I, I, I mean, just did he ever tell you guys to spin your top pin? No. <laughs> <laughs> he said that he was trying to, what he was trying to achieve in the performance was like when you have a children's toy, like a top and a trumpet, and then you know all those pictures on the outside suddenly become this blur. Hmm. Like in pursuing, that's what he, what he said he wanted from us as performers to kind of create this blur. And so in that sense, like if we were landing in any one particular element, then it wouldn't be that kind of effervescent blur. I guess, I mean, as, as things shift during the whole process, if, you know, if, if the script is changing as much, but was there one that, that was that stayed true all the way through, that his original idea? Well, I found did you the find performing the of it was what, where it all came and it allowed you, he, it, he allowed you to, it, it was really a spiritual exercise to do the play, I, I, I felt. It was always felt very, like you, you're going on a real spiritual trip when you, when you would start them. And to me, that was the gift of getting to do them. You know, you, you got to, I, I don't know, it just was, it was living on this very uh, exalted plane Yeah, for me, it's the mission, you know, the mission, and again, it goes back to poetics and my humble opinion about what those were, you know, you say, no, no, it's not about that, it's not about that, but he let you keep doing what you were doing, you know, in some way, when you got to a certain place. And so, um, when it all came together, and you had an idea of the mission, you know, it, it, it was really great to try to bring that to the audience, to bring, as he said, this special gift, I'm, I'm just giving my humble gift to the audience, is what he'd say, you know, and, and to try to do that was very rewarding. We always used to say it was like there was a big feast in the next room and someone was walking through with the food and all the audience got to have was the smell of it as it went into the next room. Like he would always come up with these things like what, it, what the play was supposed to be like and that was one of the ones I remember. <laughs> Guys, the best part about this entire event for me is that I, the whole goal of it for me is to keep this conversation happening because I think as we were talking about with Linda, who's disappeared from her seat now, um, is that I, I find there's a lack of this kind of uh, passion, this the passion of form and like we were talking about before, Jim was talking about the passion of the 60s in, in how we create theater and how we talk about it as theater artists right now. And so that's why I'm really excited that everybody who's here is here and thank you for coming here and we continue this. I'm not gonna take up, we can't take up too much of more of these gorgeous people's time, but we invite everyone to try to continue this at Stillwater across the street. <laughs> because, and it actually is, it's not just the fact that I like to drink, it's actually about the fact that this conversation should continue between everybody and we just have to keep having these conversations and learning from people like these guys and making them your friends and, uh, and each other. So thank you so much for coming and thank you.
five list people coming up this year, and no one's confirmed yet, so I'll send you all an email. <laughs> So it, it was a combination of that. And he, you know, th that's another strategy of this protesting against traditional theater technique. He loves the theater, Richard Moore. He loves the theater. You know, he's, he's quitting all the time. He's always saying, I'm done with it. But he truly does. And, he, and just simple directorial effects are, are magnificent. 